this paper, uh, a brief, brief presentation was uh, twofold. I was trying to sort of bring critical theory, how do I explain the Indian criminal justice in the light of uh, critical theory? Because I had seen very little literature on this existing in India. And uh, for doing that, I thought the best would be to describe in a holistic manner the Indian criminal justice. Where does it come from? I could have taken up one measure, uh, say for instance, uh, defense of insanity. I could have taken one uh, particular offense category, say for instance, uh, homicide, and uh, focused on it. But that again, uh, I thought would have been one slice of the Indian criminal justice reality. Uh, therefore, I decided to uh, have a broader view of Indian criminal justice so that this whole broader view could uh, inform uh, the critical legal theory, theorization in India. And the broader view, to my mind, that's why I get given a title, following the colonial criminal law legacy, reshaping of the new Indian criminal law on the old lines. Uh, in my presentation, I am very much in, inspired by Ellen Norris at one time when he wrote in his earlier book, uh, Crime, Reason and History, 1993 that uh, modern criminal law was formed in a particular historical epoch and derived its characteristic shape from the fundamental features of social relations of that epoch. Its principles, therefore, are historic and relative rather than natural and general. This he was writing in contrast to a whole lot of thinkers that included, at that time, Randall Williams, Jerome Hall, scholars of that uh, caliber, who had taken a philosophical perception to criminal law, and uh, who described criminal law is a species of moral and political philosophy. To them, criminal law was a species, just as George Fletcher says, is a species of moral and political philosophy. Uh, Ellen had described criminal law as a product of a particular historical epoch and it derived its shape from the fundamental features of social relations of that epoch. My view, uh, I seem to concur with Ellen in this because I personally feel that uh, our criminal justice system is, has borrowed heavily from the colonial criminal law model. And uh, therefore, in my presentation, I will structure my presentation in three parts. One, uh, in the first part, I describe the nature and elements of colonial criminal law legacy. Second, I discuss the fact that the processes, fact and the processes that are deployed in reshaping of the new Indian criminal law. It's not a fact that only colonial criminal law continues in pure form, but it has been reshaped. The criminal law has been reshaped by, in its new form by new Indian criminal law. And finally, I conclude by indicating certain legislative and judicial trends that constitute a kind of reversal back to the colonial legacy. <coughs> we seem to be, you call it neo-colonialism, or you call it uh, 
fascination of the colonial legacy, we seem to be going back. That is my thesis. Uh, co colonial criminal law legacy, uh, the essential just as the essential characteristic of English criminal law, were shaped by the socio-historical context of the Western liberal societies. The criminal law of England, British criminal law, reflected the values and principles that had evolved for over a period of more than 1,000 years. Unlike this, the Indian criminal law was originally shaped by the colonial <coughs> rulers who provided a complete Indian Penal Code 1860 that served as the basic law of the land such colonial criminal law was marked by authoritarian state, which, in the words of Lord Macaulay himself, are as follows. We know that India cannot have a free government, but she may have the next best thing, a, for, a firm and imperial despotism. The worst state in which she can possibly be placed that is which the memorialists would place her, they call on us to recognize them, both Indian memorialists and European memorialists had gone in delegation to Macaulay and his team, and men in the midst of slaves, as privileged order in the midst of state. They said that, give us privileged order, and for the slaves, you have any law. Uh, and see Macaulay, he's magnanimous too. It was for the purpose of averting this great evil, the parliament at the same time at which it suffered Englishmen to settle in India, armed us with those large powers which, in my opinion, we ill deserve to possess if we do not have the spirit to use it, use them now. Now, this is, I say, in 1835. Uh, this is my colleague is reading legislative minutes of 1835. And uh, this, my colleague is saying, this is, I think, the bedrock of equality principle in India. He says, I will not make a distinction between the what memorialists are saying between privileged people and the slaves. I'll have one law only. That's very good, but that law is authoritarian in nature. That is a kind of, may have the next best, next, next best thing, a firm and imperial despotism. Then this penal code has been described by Barry Wright, Thus, the IPC was all about power in the broader sense. <laughs> it was a manifestation of rich, rationalized and modernized form of authority which placed rule of law at the center and aimed to make the British governments more effective and legitimate in what seemed to be inheritable complexity of India. This is very nice writing critical and the writing I agree with him. Thus the colonial criminal law legacy was marked by the following features. It comprised of foreign values and principles. The criminal law or criminal justice that we are talking about, Indian criminal justice, is largely still comprises of Western values. English values of the 18th century, 19th century. And it constituted an imposition. It was imposed on us. We did not consent for it. We did not agree. It had the distinctive authoritarian character. It, its codified form imparted certainty and determinate, determinateness to it. Now, this has become a very significant factor for the 
later judicial interpretations. Judges saying that we are bound by this. And even today, the Supreme Court judge is saying that we are bound by this. And the worst thing that could have happened was even after independence, even after the advent of the Constitution, Article 372 was a charter of adaptation, lock, stock and barrel of the old laws. Both Indian Penal Code, Criminal Procedure Code, 1878, and the Indian Penal Code, 1860, was adapted and was brought. There was no, no rational changes in it that a free India would require. And even today, even after 150 years, more than 150 years, 1860, today is 2017, and uh, we see nothing wrong in Indian Penal Code, and the courts are repeatedly saying that this colonial legacy. Now, though the Penal Code constituted the basic framework of the criminal law, it it's, was constantly subjected to reshaping in the course of it, the interpretation by the courts the, during British uh, pre-independence period by the high courts and the Privy Council. There have been some uh, notable decisions of the High Court and Privy Council in the pre-independence period, uh, like R versus Govinda, like uh, the case of uh, Palani Golden, 1920 Madras full bench decision, <coughs> then Privy Council decision of Mahbub Shah versus King Emperor, 1942, that stand out for their liberal and moral content. They try to infuse liberal and moral values into the criminal law. That criminal law, penal code law, should become uh, liberal in its character. In the post-independence period, the task of infusion of liberal values and moral content became further complicated by the courts and legislature being required to infuse the constitutional values of equality, liberty, dignity in their interpretations of the provisions of the penal code. As a consequence, several path-breaking judicial and legislative initiatives were taken in respect to death penalty, law, offenses of suicide, which has now been abolished, homosexuality, rape, but many <coughs> Colonial prestiges continue still. Defamation is a crime still under the law and which has been recently approved by the Honorable Supreme Court in Subramanya Swami's case. That petition has been dismissed. And uh, however, the agenda for in infusing criminal law with liberal and constitutional values received a setback with the rise of terrorism and extremism that justified an authoritarian and repressive response. Now, the agenda for reshaping of new Indian criminal law uh, got in a way thought it and aborted by rise of terrorism and extremism and uh, authoritarian and repressive response to criminal crimes became the order of the day, the best way of dealing with crimes. Dangerousness argument. Now, the third legislative and judicial trends marking a reversal to the colonial legacy. The trend of reversal can be inferred by two legislative initiatives, namely the Criminal Law Amendment Act 2013 and the Juvenile Justice Act of 2015. Particularly, the measure that singles out 16 to 18 age group heinous offending children for a kind of waiver proceedings under Indian law, they have introduced. And it's very 
close parallel to Bulger case in the UK. Mm -hmm. that, uh, I was saying it is very similar to that. And we seem to have just mass uh, sort of uh, stigmatization <coughs> and <coughs> demonization of the juvenile in uh, though he, he was not even the kind of uh, death sentence that people were shouting for, but uh, all, the, all the same, the Lord, they managed to tame the Lord itself. Now, there are certain judicial decisions, judicial rulings, such as uh, the uh, case of Vidi Kunte versus Union of India, uh, 2015, and where the Honorable Supreme Court preferred to follow Mancini versus DPP, 1942, which gave a very narrow definition of grave and sudden provocation and a limited exemption. But uh, similarly, uh, finally, the paradox is that the repressive and draconian criminal law amendment act 2013 uh, is uh, a product of uh, an act of parliament following democratic tradition where the elected representatives supported the new law overwhelmingly. Similarly, the immoral judicial rulings were appreciated by the people by and large is the reversal of the colonial legacy to stay and how will it impact the theory, critical theory of criminal law in India, Indian criminal law. Now this uh, has been in my mind, but uh, I am not so much on critical theory I'm stating the context of on which the critical theory has to work out, be worked out. And the context is the same thing has been being replicated in all other areas, whether it is anti-terror laws, whether it is uh, unlawful prosecutions, whether it is encounter killings. The same authoritarian streak or all back to colonial legacy is seems to be uh, visible and uh, we are not able to rationalize it and we look for that rationalization if it is possible. Thank you very much. And I call Professor Vajpayee to give his presentation. Uh, wrongful prosecution, a critical concern in Indian criminal law.